Welcome to Finding Medina, Episode 3, The Governor Returns. I'm Brandon Seal. In March of 1811, barely six months after he had raised his grito, and less than two months after San Antonio had raised hers, Father Miguel Hidalgo was captured by Spanish Royalist forces. More specifically, he was captured by the former Royalist Texas governor, Manuel Salcedo. While in prison near Monterrey, Governor Salcedo had worked over his jailer, the impulsive and flip-flopping Colonel Ignacio Elizondo, whom we met in the previous episode, and convinced him to betray the revolutionary cause and put an end to Father Hidalgo's flight towards San Antonio. Almost from the moment that he had declared for Hidalgo, Colonel Elizondo felt underappreciated by the revolutionary movement, a grievance that conveniently grew only more acute with each battle that Hidalgo lost. Elizondo eventually decided to throw in his lot with Governor Salcedo, and at a spot in Coahuila called Acatita de Bajan, they sprung their trap. On March 21st, 1811, Salcedo and Elizondo captured what remained of Father Hidalgo's army, including the priest himself, who was sent to Chihuahua City in chains and executed on July 30th, 1811. San Antonio insurgent Captain Juan Bautista de las Casas, the man who had originally deposed former Texas Governor Salcedo, met the same fate as Hidalgo the following day. For all intents and purposes, the Mexican War of Independence appeared to be over. As a reward for putting down Captain de las Casas' revolt, the Villa of San Fernando, the principal town amongst San Antonio's communities, was elevated to the dignity of a ciudad. Yet when Governor Salcedo returned to San Antonio on September 11th, 1811, he didn't view the town's inhabitants with the same magnanimity. Still smarting from his exile six months earlier, Salcedo resolved to put San Antonians in their place. His first measure of business was to dismiss the ruling junta that had reinstated him, which to be clear meant that he was brushing aside the few people in the community that had ostensibly supported his return to power. Now, to be fair, many members of the ruling junta had also been instrumental in removing Salcedo from power in the first place, and Salcedo hadn't forgotten this. Indeed, he never tired of reminding San Antonians of the, quote, stain on their honor, end quote, for having initially supported De Las Casas, whose salted head he hung in an iron cage in the Plaza de Armas. Having removed the counter-revolutionary junta, Salcedo then proceeded to arrest all those he suspected of revolutionary sympathies and confiscated their property, which brought him into conflict with many of the town's most influential and vocal families. When they began to protest, Governor Salcedo escalated. His vengeful gaze fell, in particular, on the Delgado family. The Delgados descended from an old line of Canary Islanders who had arrived on the San Antonio frontier back in 1731. Their patriarch in 1810 was a man named Antonio Delgado, a man who had served on the city council multiple times and with distinction in San Antonio's militia for three or four decades now, earning him the rank of colonel. Yet for as long as he had battled Spain's enemies on the Texas frontier, he had also had to battle consistent royal neglect of his own community's needs. As such, Colonel Delgado had become an early and active follower of Father Hidalgo, joining him in the interior of Mexico and sharing with Hidalgo his triumphs and tragedies there. Including, unfortunately, the tragedy of his ambush at Acatita de Bajan. And so, like Governor Salcedo, Colonel Delgado had also returned to San Antonio in September of 1811. He had returned, however, as Governor Salcedo's prisoner. On August 10th, 2018, I went on Great Day SA on Kins 5 News to announce our group's efforts to, quote, crowdsource the location of the Battle of Medina. Around the same time, we pulled the addresses, several thousand of them, of all the residences in the general search area and just carpet bombed them with postcards, mass mailers, even hand-signed letters. Do you have the answer? Our postcards screamed out to recipients in size 64 font. The Battle of Medina is a story that needs to be told, we implored them. The initial response was promising. 
Actually, that's selling it too short. The initial response was exhilarating. We heard from dozens of people who knew of battle artifacts. Rusted out swords, old gun barrels, tiny cannonballs. We pursued each lead diligently, hoping to locate these artifacts, plot them on a map, and try to identify concentrations or trends. Yet the artifacts were as elusive as the battlefield itself. Despite the sincerity, and I believe honesty, of those who reported artifacts to us, two centuries of family moves, house fires, and a lack of general interest in the battle seemed to have scattered all evidence to the winds. When it came down to it, we initially weren't able to put our hands on any actual artifacts. Still, in talking to the folks who responded, we learned information about the area that we never would have found in books. We met people like Fred Martinez, a parishioner at the same El Carmen church from episode 1, which claims to be a burial site of some of the dead from the Battle of Medina. But Fred wasn't just any parishioner. Fred is an avocational historian, active in Los Becareños Genealogical Society, and a former Bear County Historical Commission member. Fred's ancestor, Dionisio Martinez, had received one of the original land grants along the Medina River just after the battle, and not far from it. Fred told us how these lands along the Medina River were among the most prized by old San Antonians. How they laid out their tracks in long, skinny porciones along the Medina River so that everyone could water their livestock. Then, to pull their livestock off the riverbanks and maximize the grazing on their property, they also dug shallow wells back in the dry stream beds of the Encinal, which represents the outcropping of the prolific Carrizo Aquifer. Even just a few decades ago, back when the water table was higher, you could find reliable water just a few feet below the surface of the Encinal de Medina. Las Gallinas Creek, for example, the stream along which the royalists probably camped the night before the battle, was formerly referred to as Los Charcos de Gallinas, or the Puddles of Gallinas, because of how the stream would hold water in spots. In meeting with Fred and the others who responded to our mailers, we had the chance to begin exploring the area on foot. We walked roads, looked through cemeteries, and trudged through streams. I began to spend every free lunch that I could at different restaurants along the Bear Atascosa County line, talking to anyone who would let me buy them a hamburger. One of the people that I met over hamburgers was named Kathy Brown. Actually, she sold me the hamburger. At the time, she owned Home Plate Burgers on Old Pleasanton Road. And this, by the way, was just one of the many entrepreneurial accomplishments in her impressive career, which also includes the invention of chocolate tamales. Check them out at chocolatetamales.net. They're awesome. They make great Christmas and fiesta gifts. Kathy was another longtime resident of the area, who traces her family back to José Antonio Navarro and later Mexican President Venustiano Carranza. Having grown up in the general area of the battle, more specifically, along Old Pleasanton Road, Kathy possessed a wealth of anecdotes about some of the major players from the Battle of Medina period, including Santa Ana, who legend says camped on her family's land at some point in the distant past. She talked about playing in the nearby streams as a child, where her grandfather would send her and her siblings to go, quote, dig for Santa Ana's treasure, end quote and where indeed they would occasionally find little treasures like buttons, spoons, and marbles. Though to their great disappointment as children, however, they never found any of Santa Ana's gold. Recall that in the previous episode, I talked about how our Battle of Medina research team had been frustrated to learn that many of the maps of the old roads leading into San Antonio during the early 1800s were inconsistent. Still, all the sources and all the old maps seem to agree that in 1813, two primary roads converged on San Antonio from the south, each crossing the Medina River about 14 miles south of town. The eastern road, which the Spanish royalists under General Joaquin de Arredondo were on, came from Laredo, arcing eastward from its origin, then shooting up through modern-day Choke Canyon and Pleasanton into San Antonio. Predictably, this eastern road was known as the Laredo Road. The other, western road, was the old Camino Real, known to contemporaries as the Lower Presidio Road. This road was, in truth, older than San Antonio itself, 
having been blazed in the 1690s when Spain began sending forth entradas into Texas. As the name of the Lower Presidio Road suggests, this road began at the Rio Grande Presidio, near modern-day Guerrero, Coahuila. From the Rio Grande, this road drifted east toward the Frio River, then northeasterly through modern-day Fowlerton, Charlotte, and Poteet, before crossing the Medina River just below its confluence with Leon Creek. Rob Lakowitz, from our volunteer research team, had the idea to purchase LIDAR imagery to try to pick out potential old road paths in this area. For those who don't know, LIDAR measures distances by means of a laser light, seeing through brush and other ground cover to reveal underlying terrain features. It's been used in other parts of the world to reveal Roman trenches and Viking burial sites that were otherwise invisible to the naked eye. Check out the Rivard Report webpage for this episode to see the LIDAR images that we pulled together. Be warned, LIDAR is a subtle tool. The whiter areas on the map are higher points. The darker areas are lower ones. If you look closely enough, you can see a few dark lines crossing the topography in ways that water features, for example, don't. One of these dark lines on the eastern part of the map cuts through the thinnest part of the Encinal and runs right toward El Carmen Church. And on the western side, a collection of several parallel dark traces punch through a gap in the hills and run right alongside Kathy Brown's property on Old Pleasanton Road. And so our little Battle of Medina research team, Crystal, Rob, Zach, and I, began focusing our efforts around these dark lines that we had picked out on the LIDAR. One day, while meeting with a group of parishioners from El Carmen Church, near what we suspected to be the more easterly path through the Encinal, we found something much bigger. We found out about another Battle of Medina research group, asking some of the same questions that we were in the same areas that we were. Then, a few days later, while talking to residents along the westerly paths along Old Pleasanton Road, we learned that the same group had been sniffing around that area as well. And this group wasn't just a bunch of amateurs. They were a sort of San Antonio historical and archaeological supergroup, composed of Kay Hines, Rudy de la Cruz, and Art Martinez de Vara. In case you don't recognize their names, I'll give you their bona fides as well. Kay Hines is the official San Antonio City archaeologist and the co-discoverer of the long-lost San Saba mission. Northwest Vista College professor Rudy de la Cruz and former Von Ormy mayor Art Martinez de Vara are authors of The History of El Carmen Church, including the church's claim to be the burial site for some of those killed during the Battle of Medina. Additionally, Art Martinez de Vara has done more research and writing than anyone I know on the life of José Francisco Ruiz, who is one of the most underappreciated badasses in Texas history and a major player in the events of this series. And yet Kay, Rudy, and Art couldn't have been more gracious or more generous with their time and information. I think for both of our groups, it felt like independent confirmation that we were on the right track for something, and we began to compare notes. The other group pointed us in particular toward the work of the late Bruce Moses, a research associate at the Center of Archaeological Research at UTSA and the former chairman of the Southern Texas Archaeological Association. Bruce Moses had been fascinated by the Battle of Medina for years, and he had decided to attack the problem methodically. Like us, he realized that it all started with understanding the precise routes of the roads into San Antonio back in 1813. But Bruce took this task to a whole nother level. He started by drawing on the work of Al McGraw, a former Texas Department of Transportation archaeologist who has also published extensively on the old Spanish Caminos Reales. Bruce began corresponding with Al, and actually I found some of this correspondence in a manila folder at UTSA. They traded notes about specific details of the roads through the Encinal de Medina, down to little points like which side of a tree the road would have passed on. And Bruce went out and personally walked many miles in the presumed area of the battle, finding blazes cut into trees, photographing old swales from wagon roads, and identifying different crossing points along the Medina River. Armed with this information, he was able to document and refine Al McGraw's maps even further. Bruce's work hasn't yet been formally published, yet he was very active on Texas history discussion boards online, 
And that's where I was able to find his roadmaps. We downloaded Bruce's maps of the major roads into San Antonio in 1813 and dropped them into our master Google Earth file. We overlaid them onto our LiDAR imagery, and they were as perfect of a match as you could ever hope to find in a project of this kind. Check them out on our Revar Report webpage. Bruce's roadmaps gave new precision to our search and gave us the confidence to start mapping specific clues from Royalist General Arredondo's battle account. The first clue, recall, was that the night before the battle, Arredondo had camped, quote, a league and a half, end quote, north of a place called Rancherias. Well, local tradition and most scholars of the period place Rancherias about three miles north of Pleasanton along a stream known as Las Gallinas Creek. A league and a half would have been about four miles north of there, or maybe seven miles or so north of Pleasanton, which would have put him about a day's march south of the Medina River. Second, Arredondo also claimed that on the morning of the battle, he had redirected his march from the Laredo Road toward a different crossing of the Medina River. Well, if he had started that morning on the eastern Laredo Road, the other logical crossing of the Medina River would have been toward the western Lower Presidio Road. And now, we felt like we knew where the eastern Laredo Road had run. If we were right, we now had a starting point and a line of march for the Royalist Army on the morning of the battle. Check them out at our Rivard Report episode webpage. Bruce Moses died tragically in 2011 at the age of only 45 years old, but events since his death have validated the quality of his research. In 2016, Kay Hines and her staff at the City Archaeologist's Office confirmed the discovery of the old powder house in San Antonio City Cemetery No. 2, right where Bruce Moses had said it should be. And that's important, because the powder house is where the other army, the Republican Army of the North, started on their march toward the Medina battlefield just a few days before. No one disputed that Colonel Antonio Delgado was a rebel. Governor Manuel Salcedo had likely known Delgado from their time together back in San Antonio and would have been able to identify him among the followers of Father Hidalgo that he had captured at Acatita de Baján. Of course, Delgado wouldn't have been the type of man to hide from what he had done anyway. He was a proud old Tejano and veteran of decades of warfare on the frontier. He knew the stakes of the game he was playing when he took up arms against Spanish rule. The Mexican War of Independence was a violent, bloody affair for everyone involved. Neither side went out of their way to take prisoners. Whole units, and sometimes even civilian communities, were put to the sword. The salted head of fellow revolutionary Juan Bautista de las Casas, hanging in the Plaza de Armas, left Delgado little doubt as to the fate that awaited him. Yet being from an established family, and having served nobly in the defense of his community for so many years, Delgado had every reason to expect at least a proper death, even by the customs of those turbulent and violent times. When Governor Salcedo's executioners came for old Delgado, his only request was for a priest to hear his confession and administer last rites. A formality, perhaps, but a small source of comfort, and certainly not an unreasonable ask. Even Father Hidalgo had been granted access to a priest. Delgado's request, however, was denied. And it got worse. Delgado was escorted from his cell and marched into town, where the governor had ordered a crowd to assemble. There, in the front of the crowd, compelled to attend by a merciless and frankly petty Governor Salcedo, sat Antonio Delgado's wife. As if death weren't punishment enough, Colonel Delgado would have to die with the knowledge that he was leaving his wife with the trauma of witnessing his execution. The only account I've found of Delgado's execution doesn't reveal exactly how the old colonel met his final moment. It does, however, record what happened after the firing squad's volley rang out. As Colonel Delgado fell limp to the ground, a royalist lackey shuffled over and sawed off his lifeless head with a knife. Following the governor's instructions, he then carried it over to where Delgado's wife was sitting and began to sprinkle her 
with the blood of her executed, unconfessed husband's head. Governor Manuel Salcedo's actions after returning to San Antonio in September of 1811 are inexplicable and only serve to lend credence to San Antonians' earlier complaints of royal neglect or even active hostility toward their community. The governor's retributions and confiscations alienated even the very people who had just returned him to power. And with the execution of Colonel Antonio Delgado, the governor had radicalized a wealthy, prominent San Antonio clan with a lot of soldiers in it. Colonel Delgado's son, also named Antonio, had served for many years in the San Antonio Presidio unit himself. And his nephew, Miguel Menchaca, whose mother seems to have been a Delgado, had served as an officer in the regular Spanish army. Fans of the first season of this podcast should recognize his last name. Miguel Menchaca was descended from the great Presidio commanders of the 18th century in San Antonio, a post that had been held by his father, his great-uncle, and great-great-uncle, José de Urrutia. And like their ancestors before them, the younger Antonio Delgado and Miguel Menchaca were not the type of men to suffer injustice in silence. On the next Finding Medina. Thank you for listening. A quick postscript here. After recording, but before publishing this episode, I was contacted by someone who wished only to be known by his pseudonym, Joseph Bear, spelled B E X A R, of course. Joe Bear, or Bejar as the case may be, has been studying the roads through the Encinal de Medina in 1813 for almost 20 years now. And he made some great points to me, which I feel obliged to share with you. The main point is that Bruce Moses' path for the Lower Presidio Road that I feature on the map and that I talk about in the episode is not actually the traditional path that's given for the Lower Presidio Road. Most earlier students of the battle place that road further to the west, more in line with how modern-day Highway 16 runs up into San Antonio from Potit. Under that older interpretation, the two roads that Bruce focuses in on are really just different permutations of the same Laredo Road, which drifted about over time with changing seasons and weather patterns. Joseph Baer was kind enough to share with me and to send along his work on the roads through the Encinal de Medina, which he refers to by another common name. He calls them the Blackjack Sands. Joseph very carefully traces the migration of the Lower Presidio Road eastward, starting in about the 1730s and ending around 1813, the time of the Battle of Medina. In my opinion, I think he ultimately ties that road pretty closely to where Bruce's maps pick up. But check it out for yourself on our Rivard Report webpage and see if you agree. The accompanying documents prepared by Joseph Baer actually reflect more fully the complexity of the challenge that really exists when it comes to identifying 200-year-old roads. And by the way, Joseph, as well as myself, are more than willing to dialogue with folks who have road theories of their own. So let us know your theories in the comments section of the webpage, if you have any. And by the way, I want to thank everyone like Joseph, who has reached out to us as a part of this process. This is exactly what we hoped would happen. We've had people come forward and offer help, offer theories, offer new information. It's really, really been fruitful. So please continue to reach out, especially if you have information that we don't. We're going to try to publish everything we can here on the web pages for this series to leave it as a resource for future generations and future researchers. Also, go to iTunes or Stitcher or SoundCloud or wherever you get your podcasts and leave a review of this series. Because if everyone who listened to this series left a review, it would launch these important historical events to the top of the charts. Editing for this episode was performed by Susana Canseco. Sound engineering was performed by Stephen Bennett. A special thanks to my friend George Gaetan for letting us use his music on this series. You can find out more about him at georgegaetan.tripod.com. Thanks to my SWCA environmental research buddies, Crystal Allgood, Rob Lakowitz, and Zachary Overfield, as well as to Kay Hines, Rudy De La Cruz, and Art Martinez de Vara. Thanks to Brian Stauffer, our unofficial old Spanish document transcriber. To Samantha Alanis, our cartographer-in-chief. To Cesar Gutierrez, our unofficial Archivo General de la Nación researcher. And to UTSA's Dean of Libraries, Dean Hendricks, our unofficial all-other document finder. 
And for more information about our podcast and other projects, check out www.brandonseal.com.